Welcome my YouTube chemistry audience. The following video that you're about to see is kind of unconventional in the world of the videos that I usually produce. It's actually a recording of a live lecture that I gave to my students during the 2012 spring semester teaching them how to use SciFinder Scholar. SciFinder Scholar, which is a very, very useful chemistry database software, is one that we professional chemists use all the time. It's often just referred to as SciFinder. I've posted this video on YouTube, not because I think it's particularly stellar, but because I think it does provide some useful instructional information on how to use SciFinder Scholar. I'm also hoping to use this video to help train new students in my lab on how to use this database software. More particularly, of course, I hope that this video lecture, despite being unscripted and slightly rough, will at least provide the fundamental information that you will need in order to be able to navigate through the use of SciFinder Scholar. I'm aware of the fact that some of the specific information that I give is uniquely particular to students at my institution, Utah State University. Nevertheless, I anticipate that much of the information provided here will be generally applicable to anyone using SciFinder Scholar. Now, in giving this video tutorial, I'm not trying to give any particular endorsement or commercial for SciFinder Scholar. I just know that as a professional chemist myself, I use it all the time. And I'm hoping that you guys will also find this video lecture useful. So please sit back, enjoy, take notes, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. So to access SciFinder Scholar, you'll need to be on a USU networked computer. Or if you're not, you'll need to have, as a USU student, your A number and password. You then have to navigate to the USU library homepage. You can find that, of course, by going to USU and searching the Merrill Kazir Library homepage. I have it bookmarked and showing here on my screen right now. Scrolling down the USU Library homepage, you can see this link right here that says Articles and Databases. Click on it. You'll now see that we have access to articles and databases in various different disciplines. The one that we're going to look at right now is under Chemistry and Biochemistry. If you click on that, you can see various databases to which we have access. The one that we're going to click on, of course, is SciFinder. At this point, if you are not on a USU network computer, it will ask you to enter your A number and password. You can go ahead and do that here. At this point, if you want to register your own account, you can do so by following these steps right here. If you already have an account, you can click Login here. This takes us to the login screen for SciFinder Scholar. I, of course, already have this bookmarked on my computer. At this point, you're going to enter in your username and password. After clicking a button acknowledging that you accept their terms of agreement, you are taken to this page, which is the home page for SciFinder Scholar. This might look like a boring piece of software, but I really want to show it to you because it's... Man, we use it all the time. So if I click up here and explore reactions, and then click here, I can draw any structure I want. What structure do you guys want to draw? So Chad suggested that we draw that as our starting material. What product do you want it to turn into? Now keep in mind, I'm not going to turn that starting material into, you know, like a Ferrari in one step. So <laughs> let's come up with something that looks a little bit more like close to the starting material, something like that. Okay, so what I do is I draw my starting material and my product. And then I click on this arrow and I go between them. And it'll automatically categorize this as my reactant or reagent and this is my product. If I want, well, I'll show you some more details about this later. I'm going to hit OK. Now you can modify your search a little bit if you want to modify the total number of steps. Like I want only, I want to achieve this in one reaction step as opposed to 20 or something. Uh, I can also do some other modifications to this. I will frequently click on sources other than patents 
you don't have to do that, but the reason I do that is because patents often have procedures in them that are difficult to read, whereas sources other than patents, which is peer-reviewed journal articles, are usually pretty straightforward. Now I hit search. And it's going to search and try and find, and it will search any reaction that's ever been published on the face of the planet in which that starting material was turned into that product or something like it. This is going to take a while because this is a very, I think this reaction is very generic. So there's probably, it's going to have like probably 25,000 hits or something. Okay, so let's take a look at this first reaction. So, so what we have here is this starting material. What's highlighted in red is what we drew. And what's highlighted in red over here is, is the product that we drew. Do you see any problems with this starting material? Yeah, the starting material has an OH on it, doesn't it? And our, we didn't want an OH. But what the software does is it also looks for anything that looks like your starting material. So you'll notice that our starting material looks exactly like this red chain. It's just that ours doesn't have an OH on there. So in order to tell the software, I want to find the starting material that doesn't have an OH on there. So get get that OH out of there. What I have to do is I have to draw hydrogens at that position. Does that make sense? And then I have to use this tool. It's called the lock atoms tool to tell the, the software I have to have two hydrogens at that position. Don't give me an OH. And now it will eliminate any candidates that have OHs or anything other than two hydrogens there. Here's another thing that I need to tell you that's a subtlety. You'll notice uh, that I haven't told the software specifically that I want to convert this carbon right here into this carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen here. In other words, the software will actually find any compound on Earth that looks like this compound that has a carbon anywhere that has two OHs that is somehow converted into a product that has a carbon anywhere that's now double bonded to an oxygen. And these carbons might not actually be the same carbon. That might sound weird, but it's possible that I could have already had a carbon double bonded to an oxygen in my starting material somewhere that wasn't this carbon I'm specifying and it ended up in the product somewhere and it's not the same carbon that I was looking at. So what I can do to fix that is I use this number tool. I'm going to point at this atom, point at that atom, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say, hey stupid software, I want this carbon in my starting material that's stuck to two H's to be this carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen and nothing else. And now I hit search and that'll narrow things a lot more. And I haven't told it, uh, limited it to a certain number of steps, so we'll see what we get. So this looks like our starting material exactly. And this looks like our product exactly. And it looks like they did indeed, they've, the way it's drawn, it's actually flipped around, so this isopropyl group is pointed to the left in our starting material, it's pointed to the right in the product. But it does look like this carbon that's a CH2 is this carbon in the product that's double bonded in oxygen. What are the conditions they used? Well, they, it says that they did this in one step by treating with O2, oxygen, this reagent that has this number. I don't know what this reagent that has this number. And uh, this is uh, pyridine and some other stuff. It doesn't say what yield this reaction is, but it looks like we got plenty of uh, different reactions. So it might turn out uh, that you look at these conditions and say, hey, I don't like those conditions. I want to go down and find different conditions. So I can scroll down and see these guys used this reagent, which looks a lot simpler. Um, some of these will show yields and some of them don't. So I'm going to show you a couple of other things. This little hourglass that has a price tag stuck to it, or it's a, an Erlenmeyer flask, sorry, tells you that this reagent is commercially available. And if you click on it right here, you can go to Get Commercial Sources, and it will tell you the list of all the people who sell it. It doesn't tell you the prices, however, so if you want to find that out, you can go to the individual uh, websites for the individual suppliers. But, of course, this product is also commercially available. So this is a reaction I would probably never run in real life because I could just buy the product. If I want to find the specific conditions 
what I'll do, so this, these conditions were reported in this article written by these people. I click on this full text link. So I'm going to click on that link. This is the person's full paper. Uh, and this paper was published back in 1990. So you can, sometimes it's hard to do this, but you ha can read through this and find the specific reaction and the conditions, and they'll actually have a written procedure somewhere on exactly how many, what reagents, what solvents, what temperature, how many equivalents of each reagent they use to run that specific reaction. Sometimes uh, when you get these answer sets, they'll have the same answer written multiple times. I don't know exactly why, but if you go up here and, uh, and that happens, it'll have an option that says remove duplicates. So it'll remove duplicates from the list. Another thing that you can do is you can change the, the sorting. So sometimes I like to sort by year instead of sort by relevance. I guess it doesn't like to do that when you have 137 different thousand different reactions. So some of these options uh, might might work a little bit better if we find a more specific reaction. You might be in a, a circumstance where you don't really want to learn anything about a particular reaction. You want to just look up a specific substance. So if you have a substance and you don't want to know a reaction, you just want to know, learn more about that substance and you know its structure, then you can draw the structure here. Okay, so let's look up this exact substance. Now, I, I wish this picture would disappear. Sometimes this picture is kind of a, kind of a dork. There we go. So, um, for some reason, our USU subscription doesn't allow us to click on substructure or similarity. But I've used that before. There's some other ways you can limit your search. I want single component, otherwise it'll give you, you know, use substances if they're multi-component substances. And I want to do exact structure and I'll hit search. Some structures are vague enough like this one where it might get multiple hits. So I drew it wrong according to Chad's request, but if, assuming that that were what we're actually looking for, you could find a substance that you actually like and you can click to find more about it. I could click on this arrow and I could go get reactions where this substance is a product. And it will get an, a reaction list that shows you the, uh, the starting material that they use to make that compound. I can also click, if I've got one of these guys, these orange guys, who sells this. See that? And there's another way to look up substances, and that is by clicking on Explore Substances, and then clicking on Substance Identifier or Molecular Formula. So if I don't want to draw the structure, I'd know the compound's name, I want to look up cocaine. <coughs> I can just type cocaine, hit search, and here's the structure, and whoa, it's commercially available. It, it is, by the way. Uh, for research purposes, you can buy cocaine. Uh, for non-research purposes, you can buy it as well, but not from officially sanctioned sources. <laughs> so I could click on this, and I could uh, look up Get Commercial Sources, and I can see who sells cocaine. And then I can contact any of these suppliers that I want. So that brings me to the end of my lecture on how to use SciFinder Scholar. I hope it's been as enjoyable and as illuminating for you as it has been for me. Good luck with all your science research out there, teachers and students alike. I hope you're able to use this resource to help expand our knowledge base of science and chemistry from the world around us. Have a good day.